Well, I said, Roth, I'd like to introduce you to two of my guests. Uh, the first guest you can't see, but he's here. His name is the Holy Spirit. And where he is, there is liberty, there is freedom, there are miracles, there are everything you read in the Bible, plus some, because this is the last of the last days. And I'm on a brand new set with my second guest, Chad Gonzalez. Now, Chad, um, this is the first time I've, this, you know, you just started doing the shows. Yeah. Yesterday was the first time I saw this set, and I was watching it on TV, and it's magnificent. How do you like it? I'm loving it. I'm enjoying this. It's an honor to get to do this with the network. And, well, and what he's talking about is it's our uh, online network. It's Supernatural. Uh, you can get it as a free app. Uh, just go to the App Store, type in my name, Sid Roth, and, uh, and, and just uh, look for a nice orange app uh, that says ISN, it's Supernatural Network. And you'll get seven days a week, 24 hours a day, a great number of brand new exclusive shows as this one is. Uh, you call it the way of life. The way of life. And, and I have to tell you, the reason that I'm doing this is number one, introduce you to Chad and his new show so uh, you'll be able to watch it on our network. Um, but there, there's another reason. Chad recently got back from Africa, from Kenya. And he had the opportunity to meet and interview a former witch doctor who is now a strong believer in the Messiah. Because he had a lot of questions to ask about the authenticity of the power in witchcraft, about uh, who did he think was stronger when he was on the other side of the fence. And the thing that intrigued me the most, Chad, was you said, this did nothing but strengthen your faith, and we can strengthen the belief and faith of those viewing right now, right. because after he got this, this revelation, he took this revelation, and the miracles have moved to a higher level. I mean, you were even telling me one service uh, where the glory came in. Tell yeah. me about that. So, you know, I've had that happen one other time in the service, it was many years ago. But actually, this was just a few weeks ago. We were down in Columbia, South Carolina, mm -hmm. and we had done a couple of services, but the Sunday night service, we were ministering, and uh, I mean, it was just like popcorn going off. People were getting healed all over the place. Many of them we didn't touch. There was a lady that- You, know, you uh, realize, as you're sharing this, there is power in the testimony. Yeah. As he's sharing it, I'm beginning to hear words of knowledge, which means I'm reacting from the presence of God that he was in when the glory of God was in that church and people were being healed like popcorn. I believe they're gonna be healed just by watching this, us now. It's the same word, just as anointed. And these testimonies he's inspired. This service, all these people are getting healed. And at the end of the service, and we went about, about three, three and a half hours, a little long, and so I was using a handheld mic. I gave the mic to the pastor that was sitting on the front row. And they get up, when they got up to the stage, they fell out on the floor. And I'm sitting there looking at that. Did you lay hands on them? No, I just gave them, I gave them the microphone. Well, you see, my understanding, Chad, is in the glory, especially where there's a cloud, all you're doing is facilitating. Right. God's doing everything. Yeah. Yeah. They walked up there and fell out under the power of God. Well, I was so, I was just exhausted. I was tired because we'd done multiple services really long. So I walked to the back and I went and sat back down at the, at the back of the sound booth and I'm looking up at the front and I, I start kind of wiping my eyes because we saw this just haze up in the front, all in front of the stage where the pastor fell out. And I wasn't the only person that saw it. Multiple people were commenting that they could see the, the glory cloud up there in the front. And then it started hitting me, all these miracles that were happening that night. Like the miracles that happened that night were, were many, many, many times magnified than the ones that happened the prior services. And yet I'm sitting there with my eyes seeing this cloud, but I wasn't the only one. But see, that's kind of a preview yeah. Of, and I hate to use this word, but I will, 
and I hate to use it because, well, you'll understand when I say it, uh, that, that's kind of a preview of what's going to be normal. But it's never going to be normal if God shows up. <laughs> but it's normal based on the Bible. Yeah. Um, uh, Chet, tell me some recent miracles. In fact, you tell me you're starting to get really amazing medically confirmed mm. miracles, and that's what the world needs. Yeah. That's what you want to see. That's what I want to see. Medically confirmed miracles. Tell me one. So in that service, hmm. that same night, the pastor's cousin had been diagnosed with clear cell cancer. I'd never heard of this particular type. I haven't either. We found out it's extremely rare. Less than 1% of people get it. There's, there's no cure for it at all. Even chemo won't do anything to it. Well, she was in Pennsylvania, and the pastors were telling her, hey, you need to come to these meetings. They were telling her about some things we'd been experiencing. So that Sunday night service where we saw the glory cloud, I laid hands on her. This woman, I laid hands on her, and I just sensed that it was a demonic thing. We took authority over it and went on with the rest of the service. Two weeks later, I'm in Miami at the Miami airport, and I get a phone call, and it's from the pastor. And they're screaming and shouting. They said they just got a phone call from the cousin. The cousin had went to the doctor, and the doctor ran scans, and they couldn't find an ounce of the cancer, couldn't find it anywhere. And this lady, you know, from what I understood, maybe not a strong believer, but now she is. I'm sure she is. <laughs> and, and the great thing was it inspired the rest of the family. Because now the rest of the family, they're wanting to know more about these things that we are teaching about our union with Christ and how healing should be normal you know, for us and walking in the glory and things of that nature. So it inspired them. Uh, in that same service, we had a woman who she had a, a lump in her chest. And it was just funny because we're talking about these things and uh, she had raised her hand. She said, I've, I've got a, a lump in my chest. And I said, well, maybe you don't. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, we're talking about God being on the inside of you. And this is normal. Maybe it's not really there. And she said, well, yeah, but it was here when I came in. I said, but maybe it's not. Maybe you should just go to the restroom and go check. So she goes to the restroom, comes back with a smile on her face. And I said, what's going on? She said, it's gotten smaller. And I said, well, maybe it's just gotten smaller since, <laughs> since you left the, the bathroom and came to tell us that it gotten smaller. I said, maybe you should go back and check. So she goes into the bathroom, comes back. And but she wait said, a second. I'm just, I'm just, I, I've got to ask him this question. What if she came back and said, no, it's the same size again? <laughs> what, what, you got, what happened to your service? I'd send her back <laughs> to go check again. Okay. <laughs> I've actually had that happen once. Um, but I told her, go back and check. Because it's like, it comes down to this, like, we have to believe that we truly do have authority with our words, that we are in a position of dominion over the earth, that we literally do have power over all the enemy and over every sickness and every disease, and that sometimes we don't need to lay hands. If the Lord's leading us to just declare it, we need to have just as much power, or we need to have just as much confidence in our words to produce as we would our hands to release. Because Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. But what happens when you have this confidence in your word and you speak this word and nothing happens? What happens to you? Well, that's when you determine if you're a man or a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do I really believe this thing or not? Because think about it. You know, there was times where, even with Jesus, he laid hands on the blind man the first time, right. didn't get a full result. So what does Jesus do? Well, obviously the Holy Spirit told him, do it again. The, the madman at Gadara, when he told the demon to come out, nothing happened. Well, what does Jesus do? He hears from God what to say. And so in that moment, he said, you know, ask him his name. So Jesus went that route and then got a miracle. Sometimes there's this thing of just this tenacity, like even when Jesus, I just thought about this, even when Jesus cast the demon out of that, that, uh, that boy having epilepsy, okay, we see that the disciples, they went to do it. And we know that they had been getting results before. They had come back to Jesus and said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. But we see with Jesus that when Jesus told that devil to come out, then what happened? The devil threw that boy, convulsed him on the ground. I, I'm a very firm believer that's exactly what happened with the disciples. And they looked at that and said, oh, I guess it didn't work. And they panicked. They panicked. And, and as a result, nothing happened. But that happens with Jesus. Jesus acts like, hey, what I said is actually going to come to pass. This, this is just a little, you know, aftershock and continued on and the demon left. So 
there's this thing where we've been talking these good uh, talks about faith. We've been preaching these good sermons about our authority and dominion. But if we want to really be uh, active participants in this great awakening, this great revival, like we've got to be determined that we actually believe this thing and we're willing to put our reputation, our pride on the line, where in one sense, I'm willing to look like a fool if it doesn't happen, but no, it will happen because God's faithful to his word and he's going to back up my words because I'm speaking on his behalf. I'm the body of Christ. This is the mouth of Jesus, the hands of Jesus, the feet of Jesus. You know, we've made that statement before. You may be the only Jesus that someone meets. And usually we use that in, in reference to be a good person. But there's more to just being a good person and having good morals and high character. We need to be a representative of the kingdom and, and walking in the same dominion that Jesus actually gave us. So that's where it kind of comes down to the whole, you know, imagination thing. Well, I'll tell you what, before we even get there, that's where I was going to take him because I talked about him going to Kenya talking with a former very high level witch doctor who now is a believer in Jesus. In fact, you said he's now a pastor. Yeah, he's a bishop. A bishop. Oversees nine churches. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tell me some of the things you asked him and learned from this. So I was really intrigued because they all know for a fact that they're a spirit being. And, you know, because it doesn't matter if you're saved or unsaved, we're all spirits. So when they come to the Lord, they know all these things. They already know those. They understand the yeah. invisible world. We don't here in the West. Yeah, they actually believe it. We, we, we talk about it. They actually believe that they are a spirit. And because they're a spirit, they actually believe that they can access the spirit realm. Well, again, whether you're saved or unsaved, the spirit realm is still the, it's the realm of demons and it's the same realm of the angels. Mm -hmm. It's just on the demonic side, they didn't have access to God. They didn't have access to the kingdom. They only had access to the, if you want to get real Star Wars with it, they only had access to the dark side. You know, we as believers, we've got access to the light. And we have authority over the and dark side. And we have authority side. over that. Yeah. Oh, that's what I love. <laughs> yeah. But they actually believe, they knew there is spirit and they have access to the, to the spirit world. And so because of that, I wanted to, to understand from him, you know, what are you doing to access that? And I already, I already knew the answer. I just wanted some things confirmed. Mm -hmm. And it came down to their imagination and meditation. And the thing is, is that everything that Satan does, it's always counterfeit. And that was the reason I was having these converse, conversations. It, it wasn't to be weird. I wanted to know, looking at it from that perspective, because when you see what's happening on the demonic side and it's counterfeit and it's a lesser power, then it shows you what's possible on the things of God, what's possible on the kingdom side. How, how much have we watered down our salvation? You know, and, and if, you, if you see what they're doing and things they're accomplishing, and so I asked him, I said, talk to me about meditation. And he said, well, this is what I would do when I was going to pronounce a curse on someone. He said, I would get up early in the morning. And he, looked, and he stopped and looked at me and he said, and Christians are lazy. And I started laughing and I said, why? And he said, because Christians won't, they won't do this. They won't get up and spend time praying. They won't get up before the sun rises and pray. He said, but as a witch doctor, I would get up before the sun would rise and whatever curse I was going to pronounce on a, an, an individual, a city, region, church, whatever. He said, I would get up early before the sun would rise and I would begin to meditate on that curse. And he said, I had a chair that I would take, I'd put off away from my family outside of the house. And he said, I would stay there in that chair and meditate, use my imagination to see myself speaking that and seeing that coming to pass. He said, I would not leave my chair until I knew that what I was gonna say was gonna come to pass. Well, I mean, that, that's a little bit of Mark 11, 23. Yeah. If you believe it, you speak it, you'll have it. And so, but that's the counterfeit side of that. But he said, once I, I was confident that what I was going to say was going to come to pass, he said, I would walk up to the window, I'd look out and see the sun. And he said, I'd, I'd make a covenant with the sun. And he said, I'd look at the sun and say, if nothing in this world can stop you from rising, nothing in this world can stop my words from coming to pass. And he said, then I would go out and pronounce my curse. You know, um, I, I, I can't comprehend what happens even using those methods against a strong, spirit-filled Christian. You asked him that question. Mm -hmm. What did he say? I asked him, I said, what could you do to a Christian? 
And his response was very, very blunt. He said, it depended on if they knew who they were. Huh. Depended on if they knew who they were. And he said, I had many Christians. He said, I would have college students come up to me from the seminaries and universities. They'd come out here to do some witnessing and stuff. And he said, I finally got tired of it one day. And he said, I made a, he said, I made a public spectacle of them. And he said, this group of university students from, from a Bible school, they came up and they're trying to convert me. And he said, it was in a public setting. And he said, I just got angry and I yelled out where everyone could hear. And he, and he said this, he said, do you really know your God? Or are you just telling me about what you learned in university? And he said, they put their head down, turned around <laughs> and they walked off. And, uh, but he said, the Christian, it really, it really came down, do they really know who they are? Could you take a couple of minutes and talk to those viewing right now and tell them who they are from a biblical perspective? Yeah. Right now. So let me tell you who you are. In the church, we, we really have this identity crisis going on. We're looking at this to tell us who we are. This is not you. You are a spirit being. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have literally become united with Him. You're one with Him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. Jesus' prayer uh, in John 17 was, he was praying that we would become one just as he was one with the Father. The Apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. So there's this wonderful reality about who we are. And because of who we are, we have the very same power, the very same dominion over Satan, over all the demons, over all sickness, disease, everything related to the curse in the exact same way as Jesus Christ. But if we do not understand it, if we don't know who we are, we could be saved in our spirit. But if we're still thinking like a sinner, seeing like a sinner, thinking like a cursed person, we're still going to get cursed results. Why is that? Because whatever our soul was connected to, that's what's going to flow through us. That's what we're going to experience. And that's where the vast majority of Christians are right now. We're all united with Him in spirit. It's a spiritual reality, but our soul was still plugged into the curse because we haven't renewed our mind. This is what Paul was talking about. We have to renew our mind, change the way that we think so we can prove, so we can prove the perfect, acceptable, good will of God. And what is the will of God? The will of God is heaven on earth. And we are the ones that have to do that. And it has to do with our imagination and our soul. But we have to know who we are so we can manifest that. Um, before you get, now, I really want him to teach on biblical, sanctified use of the imagination that God has given us to accomplish the Word of God. Uh, but you met another witch doctor uh, that was not a believer in Jesus, yeah. and you challenged him. What did you say? Well, this was a situation we didn't even know we were going to meet him. We were meeting with a village pastor. Uh -huh. And he said, and I told him why we were there. And he said, well, actually, I know the witch doctor. And he's very renowned in the, in the country. Government officials go to him. Do you want to meet him? I said, sure, let's go. So we went over there. We began to talk to him and, and hearing different stories of what they were doing. But as we were talking, I, I just kept getting this sense on the inside. He's open. He's open to hearing about Jesus. And Again, he's telling some pretty wild stories about things that they were doing. So I began to tell him about some of the healings that we were experiencing because I found out that these witch doctors, yes, it's demonic, but they saw themselves as good people. They saw themselves as helping people. They're deceived. Yeah, they're deceived. They, they, but they saw themselves as good people. Mm -hmm. People would come to them for healing. And, and most of these people, they would actually go to a witch doctor before they would go to a medical doctor. They would go to these witch doctors and they would come to him and he told us about situations where he tried to help people. And so I seized on that, and I began to tell him about the miracles that we were seeing, healings that we were seeing. And I said, you know, if you, if you really want to help people, you really need Jesus, because he's actually more powerful than what you're operating in. And that caught his attention, because that's what he was all about, the power, the power, the power. And, and that's what he asked me, he said, if I receive Jesus, am I going to lose my power? <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, you'll actually get a whole lot more. And he said, I'll take Jesus. You see, you see the antennas go up when yeah, you, see, you yeah. said that? Hey, I want more. Yeah. And so through the interpreter, 
you know, we led him to the Lord and he said he wanted to start going to church and we were actually going back Wait, to Wait, didn't he tell you that he had a certain number of, yes. did he say demons in him? Or no, what did he, he say? didn't call them demons. What did he, he say? He called them friends. Ah. Because I asked him, I said, so how, do, how did you know what to do in these situations? Because he told us some different examples of things he had done. I said, how'd you know what to do? And he said, well, my friends told me. And he said, actually, my friends told me that, that you and your friend were coming today. <laughs> and his said, friends are demons, familiar spirits, the Bible calls, yeah. calls that. So uh, what happened to those demons? Did you command them to leave? Yeah, we told them to go because I said, well, where are these friends? He said, well, they're in me. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, how many are there? And he said, there's 10. Oh, no. <laughs> and so, yeah, so when we were leading into salvation, we took authority over, over all those demons and told them to go. Weren't, weren't you a little bit afraid of these demons? I'm going to be really honest with Please. you. Please. So I'd been there a few days. This is before we met the guy. I'd been there a few days, and I'm hearing all these stories from different people that had either been involved in witchcraft or experienced it in their family. Because, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's heavenly renowned there. Of course. In, in Kenya. And so I've, I've been hearing stories. And I wasn't planning on meeting with this guy. It was just a, mm -hmm. a random thing that happened. And so we're driving down this little dirt road through this little village. And I wasn't thinking much about it until we pulled into his, uh, his, his little homestead. And the, re the little village pastor that was with me, he said, well, that's his house. And this little hut, it was, it was a round hut with a thatch roof. He said, that's where he does the witchcraft. Immediately when he said that, the thoughts came to me. Do you really know who you are? What are you going to do if he tries to put a curse on you? You know, all these, mm -hmm. all these just satanic thoughts. Satan and, and these. by the way, that's the key. These, these weren't his thoughts. Yeah. These were the enemy's thoughts to stop him from getting that witch doctor delivered and saved. That was, that was, and that's all the devil can really do unless you partner with him in the thoughts. Yeah, these thoughts are coming, because why? Because he's trying to get me to, to let my imagination get on that. And I recognize it really quick, because I started to, I felt fear starting to come on me, and I had to get a hold of my mind. And if really your quick. imagination gets in it, then, then it's like, uh, the opposite of true biblical belief, it's true biblical belief in the power of the enemy. Yeah, that's what's going to become your reality, and that's what you're going to put your faith on. Whether it's good or bad, that's what you're going to put your faith on. So I had to, I mean, that's what Paul tells us, cast down those thoughts and imaginations. I had to do that in the back seat of that little truck really, really quick, because <laughs> we're pulling right. in there, and the witch doctor's coming out. So I grabbed a hold of my thoughts, and, and then I was good after that. But yeah, I'm honest. When we started pulling up, those thoughts started coming. Do you really know who you are? Give me about one minute teaching right now on where, on the, because I've heard you teach on this, the power of the imagination of a true believer. If the witch doctors use imagination for evil with a counterfeit, uh, no power except what we give them. That's all they have, what we give them. Uh, Teach a little bit about what you know about imagination right now from a Christian viewpoint. Well, from a Christian viewpoint, the imagination, God gave us the imagination. Satan knows the power of the imagination. And this is what Satan pulled off in the Garden of Eden with Eve. He comes to Eve. He has no authority over them. They're one with God, made in his image and likeness. But what does he do? He brings these thoughts, these ideas, these suggestions, tells Eve, hey, you don't have this. You're not like God. If you'll eat of that tree, you'll become like God. And, and it's a really interesting verse because it says, when Eve saw that that tree was good for food and it would make her like God, even though she'd been seeing that tree all the time, but all of a sudden in her mind, in her imagination, she'd been looking at it. She's, she's hearing these, these temptations, these thoughts, suggestions. All of a sudden her perception changed in her imagination and she began to see differently. She began to see differently. And what does she do? When she saw differently, that's when she acted on it. So, so through our imagination, those imaginations, they're going to lead to manifestations. To actions. To actions, whether good or bad. And, and that's how all of that takes place. And yet that's what Satan's been doing all of these thousands of years. It's the same temptation, the temptation of Eve. He does it to us all the time because so he if, has no authority. If over you're us. praying for yourself to be healed, just very briefly, and you're sitting in a chair 
and you're meditating on scriptures, how do you use your imagination to even see yourself healed? So I've got a great example of me. So I never get sick. I haven't been to the doctor in a long time. But several years ago, I got into fear. I allowed fear to, to run rampant in my, my thoughts for a couple of mm -hmm. days because of some financial situations. And, and I, one night I, I walked to the shower. I start putting soap in my arm. I looked down and I had broken out all these big bumps and, and stuff all my skin. It was hives. I didn't know it at the time. It was hives and my throat starts swelling up. Mm -hmm. I could barely breathe. I could barely swallow. And I mean, it scared me a little bit because I couldn't breathe. And, um, and so long story short, I didn't want to go to the hospital. It was at late at night, but I, I knew I was having a hard time breathing. So uh, my wife, Lacey, she's rushing me into the emergency room while we're driving. Now I'm getting mad at myself because I know what I did. It was me because I allowed my thoughts just to go crazy. And so we're sitting in the parking lot of the hospital. And I told Lacey, I said, look, look, before we go in, give me 10 minutes. Let me practice what I preach, because I was feeling pretty convicted at this point. <laughs> and so I grabbed my phone, went on YouTube, put some uh, just instrumental piano music on. I said, you give me 10 minutes. If, if it's not gone in 10 minutes, I promise I'll go in. So I just sat there, closed my eyes. I wasn't trying to get healed. I closed my eyes, and I just began to see myself seated at God's right hand in Christ. This was just a, you know, I wasn't seeing a, a vision or anything, just purposely with my imagination. I'm seeing myself seated beside him, and I put my hand on his hand, put it on, on the, the arm of the throne. And just like jumper cables, seeing that life flowing through him and flowing into me, seeing myself one with Christ, that he's the vine and I'm the branch, and the life that flows through him, just seeing that flowing through me, just this surge and surge and surge of power. Oh. All of a sudden, my throat opened up, and I looked down, and all of that's gone. Now, hives, I mean, once you get that it, does typically, not happen. no, that does not Actually, happen. That literally uh, happened within a few okay. minutes. I, I, you know, our time's slipping away, but, but, here's the but. I think you might have something wrong with you physically. I know I have one something I'm believing God for. Could you be a coach right now and yeah. coach us how to use our own imagination and we'll, we'll just envision uh, the particular physical condition we're dealing with and coach us through it, coach. <laughs> well, I say it like this. I think Jesus gave us a wonderful example in John 15. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. Or we could say he's the, he's the trunk and we're the branches. And so many times I've gone outside and I'll look at that tree and I'll use my imagination and I'll see that trunk as Jesus and I'll see that branch as me. I'm doing and, that right now, by the way. And, <laughs> and I see that branch connected there. And you know, the tree and, and the trunk and the branch, they're so divinely connected that yes, you see the individual parts, but you can't tell where the trunk ends and where the branch begins. It's so divinely connected. And the only job the branch has to do is just stay there, just to abide, to stay connected, to dwell. And so as long as we just dwell there, there's no command by Jesus, no responsibilities for us to do any other thing, just simply be connected, to abide there. This is about our soul. Spiritually, it's a reality for us already, but this is about our soul. And so I start seeing myself connected with him. I see myself as one with him. Like Paul, it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. Colossians 1:27. it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Just like I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of God who dwells on the inside of me. And if the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of me, and He's the giver of the gifts, He's the dispenser of the power, then all of that power, it's on the inside of my spirit right now. The same light that was released into the universe and is expanding the universe at the speed of light, that light's literally on the inside of my spirit. I'm wall to wall, filled to full, top to bottom, filled with God, His life, His light, His power, His glory. Jesus said, the very same glory that you've given, given me, Father, I've given it unto them. The very same light that was shining out of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, that very same light, 
shining on the inside of me and flowing into my body and burning out every sickness, every disease, flowing into every dark spot that may be in my lungs, flowing into every dark spot that may be in an organ, flowing into every dark spot that may be filled with a cancer, that light flowing in and burning that out. And yet that very same light going in and causing creative things to take place. God released himself, that light to the universe to set the stage for creation. Well, that same light's on the inside of me and it's on the inside of you to begin to create, to begin to form, to refashion and remold, to cause creative things. And it's not because we have any work to do, any steps, any methods, any formulas. All it comes down to is me abiding, me dwelling in him. I in him, he in me. Colossians chapter two, verse nine and 10. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the Trinity, you wrapped up in a body. How could I be missing anything? If you love this teaching, his brand new book is loaded with information like you hear him teaching. It's called An Alternate Reality. See from heaven's perspective and manifest heaven on earth. It's a, what's called a digital download. You just go to sidroth.org slash chad, sidroth.org slash C-H-A-D. He said something powerful. He said, you have to understand the creator of the universe, oh, the fullness of God is inside of you. Only if you've been born from above. I want you to have your own experiential knowledge with Jesus. Would you repeat this prayer? Of course you will. Out loud with me right now. Dear God, I've made many mistakes for which I'm so sorry. I believe the blood of Jesus washed all my mistakes away and I am clean. I don't deserve it. But Jesus, you died for me. Thank you. I ask you to come and live inside of me and be my Lord and Savior. Amen. Be sure to go to the ISN network. It's supernatural. Just, just go, go to the web store and type in my name, Sid Roth. And uh, it's, it's called ISN. Download it. It's free, 24 hours a day, teaching like this. You'll love it.